good morning. Hey, man, I am glad you guys are ready to go. I'm ready to go. God is good, yes? Hey, awesome. And lastly, go Vikings. Yes! Dude, once I knew the Lions couldn't be there, I was, oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. Listen, I'm a Lions fan. I'm going NFC North here, man. Come on, Vikes, go Case Keenum. This guy's been an underdog, man. He's been an under, underdog, and yet he's been performing. So, man, go Vikes, dude. It's going to be awesome. Hey, if you're joining us on Facebook this morning, we or online, we are absolutely thrilled that you're joining with us, especially because the weather here is awesome. It's great. Wasn't it good to see the snow out there today? I loved it, man. I loved it. Well, if you are here for the very first time, uh, you are here at the right time because our church is in, this, in the middle of this, this uh, crazy, fun, wild, God-seeking adventure. 14 days ago, we said, hey, God, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start building this habit in the new year of seeking you first. Matthew 6, seek God first, seek his kingdom, his righteousness first, and all these things will be given to us. And so what we're doing is we're building the habit of seeking God first, but we're doing it in, in two very specific ways, where we're, we're seeking him first in prayer, and we're seeking him first by giving something up that we love, something of value. It's called fasting, and we're doing that believing that God is going to give us an answer of where he wants to use our lives to serve him and bless others in 2018. And so if you're here for the first time, or if you haven't jumped in yet, what I want to let you know is that we're inviting you to join us today. We're inviting you to join us in building this habit of seeking, God's for, seeking God first. And one of the fun things that we're doing is everybody doing this, and there's over like 1,500 people doing this, they're working through a journal. And this journal gets us in God's word. It helps us in our prayer life, in our pursuit of building this habit of seeking God first. And we believe at the end of 21 days that God is going to reveal where it is he wants us to serve him. If you're not a part... We want to invite you to be a part, and you can pick this book up at the place just outside these doors, just to the left, and invite you to join us in this grand, grand adventure that God has us on. Now, if you're like me, we've been doing this for 14 days. And man, when we get together and when we are together, it's exciting. But when we're on our own, we can sometimes get fatigued on it and think, well... Maybe I won't do it today, or maybe not right away, or maybe later, or maybe I'll get to it. And what I want to encourage you to do is don't give up. As a church, together, the people sitting next to you, we're all in this thing together of building the habit of seeking God first. Believing he's going to give an answer. And if he's already showed you where it is he wants you to serve him, whether it's the church, the city, the state, or globally, wherever it is, we never got into this thing for an answer. We got into this thing for seeking God first, believing as we build that habit, the byproduct is he'll show us where he wants us to be. So it's never about an answer. It's always about God. It's always about his goodness. So all to say, keep building that habit. They say it takes 21 days to build a habit. Keep going after it. Well, in tandem to pursuing God's grander vision for our life, we started this series. It's so wild. It's so weird. We're calling it sticky stuff. It's like all the Bible verses that you've ever highlighted, all of them that you've ever underlined, all of them that you've ever circled or you've written in the margins or things that you've stuffed in your Bible that stick. That during a certain season of your life, when you read it, it left off the page and you're like, wow, that is just what I needed from you today, God. And it is stuck in your life. You know where to find it. You know what it means. And it has got a backstory tied to it. Well, last week we talked about there are four prayers that we can add to the ones that we're praying that are sticky. Four sticky prayers. The first one was the prayer of, dear God, please enlarge my territory. And what we're meaning by that is, Lord, would you please increase our influence for you? Lord, whether it's where we work, whether it's in our neighborhood, in our home, with friends, where we play, where we go out to eat, where we shop. Lord, with those friendships, please increase my influence that I might be able to tell more people about your love for them. It's a sticky prayer. The second prayer that we prayed that sticks was, Lord, open my eyes that I might see. 
It was a prayer that Elisha prayed for a servant when God was showing up to do battle on Elisha's behalf. The servant couldn't see, and so Elisha prayed, Dear Lord, open his eyes that he might see. And we were saying, Lord, open our eyes that we might see you, that you love us, that you're for us, that you defend us, that you protect us. Open our eyes that we might see where you want us to serve you in 2018. Open our eyes that we might see if I'm not living in your will. It's a sticky prayer. The third prayer we prayed is actually a prayer that Christ prayed for us. It's a prayer of unity. That we would be one with the Father as Christ is one with the Father. That we would, that our love for Jesus would make us one together. That we would be one as Jesus and the Father are one. Is a prayer of unity. It's a prayer we can pray for each other even as I share today. The final prayer that sticks uh, that we talked about last week was just a prayer for boldness. That's good for all seasons of life. I love what Paul said. Here he is in chains for the gospel. And he says, pray that I would fearlessly declare the gospel and make it clear to those around me. And there are fearlessly, Lord, help us be bold that we would fearlessly declare your good news. Well, I get all excited about the, just the imagery of the church praying. 1,500 people. And you need to know that we're not the only church in town that is developing this habit, building this habit of seeking God first. There are other churches doing this in our city. There are other churches in our state. There are other churches in our country who there are Christians gathering this morning who have for the past 14 days been developing the habit of seeking God first on his will for their lives, that's going to change communities. That's going to change cities. That's going to change uh, states. That's going to change our world. But guess who it's going to change first? Us. It's pretty cool. So I was on my way to work, and uh, I love to listen to the radio. I'm the guy that you pull up next to who is having a concert in the truck and belting it out for all he's worth and doesn't care who watches. It's great. Well, there's this one song that came on, and I had no idea. I'd never heard it before. But this artist, his name is Torin Wells, and the name of the song is When We Pray. And he says, when we pray, this is what happens. And I just thought I'd share a few lyrics for you because he sings it way better. I thought, man, I could do a special music for us today. And then I thought better of it uh, because we want you to come back. But anyway, here we go. All right. It says this, listen to the, just the imagery of this. When the world, uh, all the world starts changing when the church starts praying. All the world starts changing when the church starts praying. Strongholds start to break. You think about the strongholds that exist in your life. Man, when you lift those things to the Lord, God begins to move and begins to shake those strongholds free. I love the imagery of this. When we pray, prison walls start shaking. I think about Paul and Timothy and, man, how man they, they were praising God and uh, how God shook those prison walls. But the truth is, each and every one of us, myself included, we have all made decisions and we have, we have put ourselves at one time or another in a prison of our own making. And yet God loves us so much, and yet his love for us is greater, his strength is greater, that when we bend our knees and admit our dependence on him, when we seek him, when we invite him into, prison walls in our lives start shaking. And at the sound of praising, nothing stays the same. We don't stay the same. Jesus his love goes forth. The world doesn't stay the same. Nothing stays the same. When we pray, when we pray, revival begins to rise. Man, wouldn't that be awesome in our country? I see hope on the horizon, a generation stepping out in faith, because we will be a people on our knees, is one before the king. Why? Because we believe. And here's what I believe. What we're doing in private, this habit of seeking God first, will not remain in those moments. God will use this habit of what we're building, of seeking him first, to bless others and bring glory and honor to his name. Like when you're sitting there praying and when you're like, do I have anything left to say? God, is there anything else that you want me to hear? Is there one more verse? Whatever it is, what we're doing in private, God is going to use to bring glory and honor to his name. Keep doing it. Today I thought what I would do is move from the praying aspect because you cannot 
open up God's word. We cannot talk about sticky stuff, the verses we highlight, the ones we underline, the ones we circle, the ones we write in the margin. You can't talk about those things without talking about God's word. So I thought today we would focus on sticky scriptures, scriptures that stick out and they grab our hearts and grab our minds. They offer hope, they offer wisdom, they offer truth. And man, the Bible's chocked full of them. And there's no way we could get through all of them. So here's just a tiny, tiny sampling of some verses that stick. And maybe you'll notice some of these are highlighted in your own Bible. First one's Philippians 4.13. That I can do all things through him who gives me strength. How many of you guys got that one highlighted, circled, underlined, or something in your Bible? How many, keep, okay, how many of you guys have said that to yourself throughout the day? You're going through something, you need God, and you're like, I can do all things, not through my strength, but through Christ who strengthens me. You ever do that before? Awesome. And that is a sticky verse for all situations, especially those big ones where we can't see our way out. Here's another one that sticks. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I don't like that verse. I want to throw a brick at somebody. <laughs> Somebody's saying a brick's not big enough, not painful enough. But look at how Jesus turns everything on his head. Because God is love, and Jesus is love. And even for those who have created and been a part of the worst atrocity, God still loves them. And Jesus says, you pray for those people who have persecuted you. Pray for them. There may be somebody in your life right now that you don't like very much. You can today start praying for them. Let's look at another sticky verse. Oh, this is so good. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. And what? He. He will make your path straight. How many times do we try to make our path straight? Trust in the Lord. What are we supposed to do? Trust. And what will he do? He will make our way straight. The hard part of that is twofold. One, trusting. And two, trying not to lean on our own understanding. Oh, this is what we see. This is what I know. No, God's saying, trust me. Trust me with the outcome. Let's just check another one. Oh, 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 oh. this is good right here, man. For the Spirit of God gave, uh, the, for the Spirit God gave us, I can read, I promise, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Listen, Paul was giving Timothy a word, this young pastor in this city, and he's like, Timothy, hey, I want to remind you. But that word is for each and every believer. Do you remember how God addressed, or the angel of the Lord addressed Gideon? He addressed him, hello, mighty warrior. And Gideon's looking around like, uh, dude, did you notice him down here hiding? And yet it didn't stop God for addressing him of who he is, who he, who he is. And that's why I'm sharing this. This is a verse that's sticky. Because this, if you are in Christ, this is you. If you are not in Christ, this can be you. God's not in the business of retreating. God is in the business of marching forward. And his spirit resides in us if we are his children. And that is not a spirit of timidity. That is not a spirit of backing down. That is a spirit of moving forward, not in our strength, but in his his strength. That's the same strength that raised Christ from the dead. That is the same strength that will empower your words when you share. It will be the same strength that works. It's not you. It's Christ in you. It's the Spirit of God in you that is that. See, God, he wants us to move forward. That is a verse that sticks. If you're feeling timid, if you get in a situation where you want to back down, when you get nervous, remember 2 Timothy 1.7. Can you tell I'm excited about that one? We all should be. Okay, awesome, cool. Hey, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess in Hebrews 10.23 through 25. For he who promised is what? Oh, man, God is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. I'm going to be honest, we, none of us in here do. None of us know the day that Jesus Christ is approaching. Like we don't know when he's coming back, but we do know this. We are one day closer. We are 24 hours closer. And the author of Hebrews says there's something beautiful about being together. 
about being in relationship with one another. You see, the people that we're meeting and gathering with today, if you know the people on your left or your right, or maybe your friends went to the service earlier, but you're in community, you're in relationship with one another, that is pivotal to the Christian, the Christian faith. Because each and every one of us has something different going on in our lives. And yet if you know one another, if we're known by one another, we know exactly how to encourage one another. And don't we need to be encouraged when we're tired, when we want to get up, when we, when we want to give up, when we're confused, when things are hard. It is good. It is it is God's gift to have people in our lives who can encourage one another. So let's not give up meeting together because, man, that would be to invite defeat. All right, let's check out this next one. For God, let's just, this is the stickiest verse of all time. You may see it between field goal posts today as you watch the playoff games. All right, it's the stickiest verse. But here is what happens when you grow up in church and you started hearing this when you were this old, this old. You loved it then. You're like, wow, this is amazing. God is love. And man, I'm a mess. And yet God loves me. He's awesome. He loves me so much, even though I'm such a mess, that he would give his son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Whoa. What I'm trying to say is do not ever become desensitized to the greatness of God. That he would love us so much that all who would believe on the name of Jesus would overcome the grave as Christ has overcome the grave. None of us can do that in and of our own, but all of us can do it because of Jesus and because of God's love for us, and that's why we praise him. Stickiest verse of all time. And I think that may be, do we have one more? No, good, all right, cool. Well, let's move on then, all right? So, hey, man, we're calling today, I'm calling today's message, I'm calling it more than words. Because God's word is more than words on a page. God's word is more than a book. God's word is alive, it's living. And all who follow these words, all who get into these words so that God's word gets into, uh, into us, it leads all of us to life. We as a church, we believe that this book, that God's good book, his holy word, we believe this is the ultimate authority on godly living right here. This is, we follow Jesus and he lived this out. In fact, Jesus is the word of God. And so as we talk about God's word today, we would be absolutely crazy. We'd be absolutely insane. I would be nuts to tell you what I think. You see, a great place to start about God's word is with God's word itself. Like, what does God's word have to say about his word? What does God have to say about it? Well, if you look in your Bibles and you can follow along with me, I'm going to start in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. This is what Paul says of God's word. It, he says, all scripture is God breathed. Now, I just want you to think about that for a minute. You see, if you do the little bit of history, which is absolutely fascinating, it was somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 years that, that, that God compiled this information. He used authors that were living in different centuries, and yet God's redemptive plan from beginning Till end that is applicable then, it's still applicable today. God has given it. God has guided it. He has authored it. He has, he has empowered people. He's inspired people to write. He protected it. And it is all cohesive. From beginning to end. Still relevant today. It's amazing. Paul's saying, I love this. All scriptures God breathed. And then I love it. And then he says this. And is useful. God's word. This right here may be one of the most useful things you own, whether you downloaded it or whether you own a hard copy or a cool camo copy. It's useful. God's word is what? It's useful. What is it useful for? Well, it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God may be what? Thoroughly equipped for every good work. What was that word? It was thoroughly. So not only is God's word useful, it is thorough. 
so that we might be thoroughly equipped for every good work that God has for us. It is useful and it is thorough when it comes to teaching and correcting so that all we can do God's good work. This is awesome. Here's what this is telling us. Listen, this morning, if, if you're feeling, if you've ever wondered where that fear and where that guilt and where shame has entered your life, you can find the answer right here. If you've got questions, if you're seeking wisdom on how to have a better marriage, if you're seeking wisdom on the half of being a better parent, if you're seeking wisdom when it comes to your finances, guess what? It's all right here. You can find it. It's in here. God's wisdom about those areas of our life, those areas of concern, the answer is in here. Like if you've ever wondered, who is God? Who's Jesus? Why do I need him? What am I doing here? Yeah, the answer's here. Listen, if you're struggling with anxiety this morning, if you're battling bouts of depression, if you're wondering if you lost somebody recently uh, that, that you loved, and you're wondering, how do I get through this loss? How do I get through this struggle? Listen, the answer's here. If you're sitting there like, man, I've been trying to do all these things on my own, and it never adds up. If you're looking for the meaning of life, if you're looking where to find life, it's right here. It's God's word. He's the author of life. And he showed us where to find life. And these words will lead us to life. Well, what else does God's word? God's word has plenty to say about itself. If you look at what the uh, author of Hebrews writes in Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. For the word of God is alive and active. You see, God is alive and active. And he has poured himself out. And he has made himself known, not only through his son Jesus, but through his word, through one another. And God's word is alive and active. And man, when you are, when you are seeking after God and when you're opening up your scriptures, and when you're reading and that one scripture for what you're going through stands out and it sticks, you're like, wow. Because there's hope there. There's life there. It is alive. It's not just a word on a page. It's not just a self-help book. You can stop. Do I think self-help books are helpful? I think they can be helpful. But what I always do is I always start right here. Because God's got the answer for everything. And then I ask my friends to pray for me. See, God's word is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitude of the heart. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Rather, everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him. Man, there is nothing about our lives that is hidden from God this morning. There is nothing like the good stuff, the bad stuff, the stuff that we don't want anybody to see. And can I just tell you a truth? Even with all that, God still loves you. Knowing that, he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to set us free. Isn't God good? Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. God's word is more than just words. It's alive and active. They're life. I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 119, 105. I remember the little Baptist school, Calvary Baptist I went to, and in third grade, they pounded the thunder out of this verse, and I'm so glad that they did. Man, Psalm 119, 105, God, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. You see, back then they didn't have Jesus, but you know what they did have? They had God's word, and they were still living in a dark world. And what the psalmist is saying, Lord, as I live in this dark world, as I live, if, as I live and there's all these pitfalls, there's all these temptations around me, I go to your word because your word is the way forward. Your word is a light that illuminates my path. You and I are fortunate enough to live in a time where we have Jesus Christ, that we get to follow him, that we get to have him lead us. And do you know how Jesus refers to himself in the scriptures? Jesus says, I am the light of the world. All who follow me will never walk in darkness. They will always live in light. When we follow Jesus, 
we are a bright, shining light in a dark and evil world. When we follow Jesus, our lives look different than the rest of the world. Our lives are a beacon of hope because Jesus is that hope that resides in us. I love what the scripture has to say about itself. Theologian R.C. Sproul says this of God's word, you cannot love Jesus and not love God's word. Now, I know that there can be a tendency to say, man, I love Jesus, but I don't, I don't really get the Bible. Like, I, I, I love Jesus, but how long must I spend in the Bible? Because that may feel more tedious. Like, Jesus is the Word. He's the Word who became flesh. I love what R.C. has to say there. Well, today what I want to do is I want to encourage you but before I do, let me just say this. Does God care if we read his word? I would say emphatically yes. It's why he went to such great lengths to give it to us. And today I don't want to just go and share some cool scriptures and we feel good and we move on. The goal today as a church is for us to get in God's word together so that we can get God's word in us that it might come alive in us and through us and empower us for every good work that he has planned. And I would tell you that if your time in God's word is marginal, then you can expect your intimacy with the Father to be marginal. If you're like, oh, it's just kind of ho-hum, oh, it's just okay, what I would say is, how are we doing? It's not a number. I'm not going to give a number. I'm not going to tell you how much time. But if your time spent in God's word is marginal, then your intimacy with him is going to be marginal because our relationship with him is directly proportionate to the priority we place on it. And if you want to receive from God, your life has to be open to him. And a great way to open your life to him is to open his word. Open your heart. Open your ear. God, what do you have for me? What is it that you want from me? Every verse we've talked about today is sticky. And today what I want to do is I want us to be without excuses when it comes to spending time in God's word. I've been praying, Lord, create in Mike Fackler, create in this church an insatiable desire to get in your word, get your word in us, and live in it out. So today I want to challenge us, I want to encourage us, and I want to caution us. When it comes to God's word, so I'm going to share three, I'm going to share quickly, three sticky words with you. The first one is a word instruction. A word of instruction comes from 2 Corinthians 5, 7. It says, Paul says, for we live by faith, not by sight. For we live by faith and we live not by sight. We live by faith and not by sight. You see, Paul is saying, what he's saying is there's a lot of people out there with 20-20 vision. Like there's some guys out there that can pick an elk out, man, like a mile away. On a mountain way over here. Like there's some ladies out there that, man, when they walk into the shopping center, they can pick out the best deals in the place from here all the way to there. Why? Because you got 20-20 vision. You know opportunities. You are honed in. But what Paul's saying is when it comes to things that matter, like the spiritual condition of your heart, the spiritual condition of your soul, when it comes to somebody's need for God, when it comes to one's awareness that God loves them and that they can experience, there are people who are blind. And, and Paul's saying, I don't want to be like that. I'm going to live my life by faith and not by sight. I'm going to live my life trusting that God's got this. I'm going to live my life trusting that God's in this, that he's working in the details, that he's working all things out for his glory. I'm going to trust that God has got the best outcome in mind. When Paul says, I'm going to live by faith, not by sight, let me just package it in one sentence for you. Living by faith is trusting God with the outcome. And there are opportunities all day long, every day, for us to trust God with the outcome. To live by faith is to trust God with the outcome. You see, when God asked Noah to build an ark, he didn't see a, so a storm on the horizon. It was by faith that Noah built that ark. He just trusted God with the outcome. You see, when Daniel, when, they, when he got bamboozled and he got thrown into a lion's den, it was faith. He trusted God with the outcome and saved him. Same with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I could say the same about Paul. When Paul was imprisoned for his faith, 
He trusted God with the outcome. But he dared pray that he'd be fearless in the meantime. Faith is, faith is pow powerful. So how do we trust, how do we practically trust God with the outcome today? Well, I'll tell you, it's going to be a lot easier than you think. When you turned on your news this week and you saw that our government shut down, regardless of what party you line up with, and you think to yourself, this is nuts, this is crazy. What I want to challenge each and every one of us to do is to live by faith and not by sight. Because by sight, it looks crazy. But by faith, we're reminded that the government rests on one shoulders. And his name is Jesus Christ. Live by faith, not by sight. You see, some of you are probably going through something today that's bigger than you, and you don't know your way out, and it can be terrifying, there can be anxiety, and you're frustrated, and you don't know what to do. And what I want to encourage you to do, what I want to instruct, just how Paul is, I want to instruct you to walk by faith, to live by faith. All God's asking you to do is take the next step. Just take another step, follow me. Just take another step, trust me. Trust me with the outcome. He'll lead if you'll follow. He's going to lead anyway, but he'll lead you through it. And it'll make you stronger. Hey, listen, if you've got a kid right now that is going off the rails and you're like, what I see is trouble, don't ever stop being a good parent. Don't ever stop doing that. But in those moments, you have an opportunity to live by faith and not by what you see. You see, the same God who loves you, who made you, made them. And he loves them even more than you do. So much so he knows the very number of hairs on their head. He knows they're coming and he knows they're going. And regardless, even if their decisions aren't honoring him right now, he still wants his best for them. Our job is to trust God with the outcome. Live by faith that God's got this and not by sight. There are opportunities all over the place to live by faith and not by sight. If a medical test doesn't come back the way you hoped it would this year. You have an opportunity to live by faith and not by what you see on a piece of paper. Because you see, there's a physician. He's the great physician, and his name is Jesus. In one way or another, he will completely heal you. One way or another. Live by faith. Not by sight. Okay, real quick. Second, second word I want to offer, one thing I want to do is a word of encouragement. I wish I could preach on this every weekend. This is so awesome, you guys. The, the Ephesians 2.10. I remember the day I read this. I could tell you where I was. I could tell you what time of morning it was. I could almost down to the minute, the day that this uh, scripture got really sticky for me. You see, this scripture is fantastic. And let me tell you why it sticks. It tells me who God is. It tells me who I am. And it tells me what I'm created for. What are life's three biggest questions? Who is God? Who am I? And what on earth am I doing here? We find all of it tightly packaged right here. And you know what? Here's what I love. Is that God, let's just read this together. For we are God's created anew in Christ Jesus to do the good works he planned for us long ago. You know what Paul's telling us? You know what God's telling us? He's saying you're not an accident. God is telling us right here that you're not an accident. That you were planned. You see, masterpieces aren't just, uh, they aren't just like boom, poof, there they are. They have to be created. And this verse right here tells me, God's word tells me that I was created on purpose. That I was created as an expression of love. That I was created out of love by God. That it was him who knit me together. And when the world and has tried to do this to each and every one of us, the world has tried to label us this. It's tried to label us that. And what God has done is he has already labeled you before the world ever saw you and he said you are my masterpiece and let me tell you where life is life is found in Jesus Christ you created a new and I have plans for your life if you're like man what, do I, what am I supposed to do with your life if you don't have Jesus invite him he'll give your life purpose he'll give you life I love Ephesians 2 10 for all those reasons and more it tells me who God is who I am who I am and what I was made for it's a good word. That's sticky stuff. All right, final word is a word of caution. I want to just caution all of us when it comes to God's word. 
And here it is. It comes from Jesus' brother James in James 1.22. He says, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. What does it say? Now that sounds like a bunch of people who walk to church and who have to walk home. You're scared. What does it say? You got to do what it says. Many people have confused listening and studying God's word and have equated that to righteousness. James saw this shift and that's why he penned it. That's why God's got it in there. He saw people who love to hear God's word, but when it came to the commitment, when it came to the living out, they're like, well, I'm just going to go back over here and maybe get another word. Because I like how that feels. But James is saying all buy-in, buy-in for righteousness, buy-in for godly living is to actually do what Jesus says. To be doers of the word. And it's a strong caution. He says, do not deceive yourselves. Jesus has said many, many things. But to just highlight a few, when Jesus says we are to love and pray for our enemies, we don't merely read God's word and so deceive ourselves because we feel good about that. We are to be doers of that, where we pray for our enemies. Anything short of praying for those who persecute you. And we are to be in danger of deceiving ourselves about who we are and what we're created to do. It's a word of caution, and it's sticky. You see, Jesus told us, he instructs us to care for the poor, for the orphans and the widows, and to care for those without justice. We, it's fun to read, it's easy to read, but there are people in real pain, there are people in real need, and we're supposed to care about them. Let's not merely read it in church, let's not merely listen to it in church, let's be doers of God's word, because anything short of caring for the poor, the orphans, and the widows, and that is not on a Congregational, see, we are the church individually and collectively. So individually and collectively, anything short of caring for the poor, the orphan, and the widow, and those without justice, we are in danger of deceiving ourselves about who we are and what we're created to do. You see, Jesus said we are to go, to go and share the good news, and that he would be with us to make disciples, to, to, pair, uh, to say it precisely, to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And be sure of this, God is with us. And here's what I'm saying, he told us to go. Let's not be merely hearers of the word and so deceive ourselves. We are to be doers of the word. Because anything short of doing, anything short of going, anything short of going, we are in danger of deceiving ourselves about who we are and what God has created us to do. It's a big, big deal. The difference between our best intentions and actual direction of our lives can be found in whether or not we're listening or doing. The church is a body of doers. Our job is to get in the word and get God's word in us and to live it out. Today when you showed up, I knew because I prayed beforehand, I knew that somebody in here or somebody's wanted to be challenged today. And the challenge is this, to live by faith, not by sight. Opportunities abound. Some will be easier than others. But the opportunity exists every day to live by faith, not by sight. That's the challenge. But I also knew today that there would be those who came in weary and wiped out, that they needed to be encouraged, that you needed to be reminded that God loves you. And so today I wanted to remind you about him and his love for you. I wanted to remind you about who you are. And so that's the word of encouragement, Ephesians 2.10. But I also knew today that some of us, including myself, may need a kick in the pants. And that's why I offered a word of caution, James 1.22. All of it is from God's word. All of it is good. All of it is sticky. Will you pray with me? Lord God, thank you so much for your love for us. So much so that you would make your love known through your son, Jesus that you would make your love known through your word. We thank you for your word. Lord, if we need to be encouraged, I pray for those who need to be encouraged. If we need to be rebuked this morning, God, I pray that we would be rebuked this morning. If we need to be corrected, I pray you would correct us, Holy Spirit. Lord, I want to say thank you for your love. Lord, the three things I ask for you for this church this week is for faithfulness, obedience, strength to do it and to do it boldly. In Jesus' name, amen.